Yeah, welcome back to the mass balance series. And we have a short input with an example for the mass balance. And I choose an example which may or may not be very familiar to you. And I will do you as an example, namely, we will do a student at rest. Just in case you're wondering, yes, I have this here somewhere where I can do the values up. Generally, it is helpful to draw a short schematic of what we want to do. So we have a student. Let's assume him or her to be happy, as you already understood the concept of mass balances. Put the student into a box. Now, because we're not merely interested, we're just balancing the masses. What are you continuously uptaking unconsciously? A volume flow of air. Also unconsciously, you also would exhale. And now let's look at something what we can do on these premises. Again, we will be looking at steady state. And we also will make some sort of shortcuts or make our assumptions a little bit easier for this example. We say, okay, let's do the same volume flow in as the volume flow out, which is not perfectly right because there will be some changes, but generally this is what we come to see first. So by definition, we say, okay, these two volume flows are equal. So how do we get these volume flows? We get them from two figures. We need the so-called respiratory volume. And that's something I looked up previously. And it's generally agreed to be something in the range of 0.5 to 0.7 liters. Then it's the question, how often do you do that? Also, there is a general agreement. You can also look that up on some sort of web sources. And there's a yeah, quite a give or take in that, but it's believed to be generally in the range of 12 to 50 per minute. As I will need this in seconds later, I will convert this now. So we have established respiratory volume, respiratory frequency, and we can treat this now as a continuous case where we get the average airflow by multiplying volume times frequency. And if you look at the values, what we get is 0.5. One, two, point one eight into per second. So this is the amount of air you pick up per second. To get to the amount of oxygen that we are interested in, we'll multiply this by the proportion of oxygen in air. 0.2, give or take a percent, 0.2 times 2, which gives us 4 oxygen as uptake. Doesn't tell us that much. I would be interested in the molar amounts. And for this, we will treat the air as um, an inert and ideal gas, which, under the conditions we typically are able to do that, 
is fair enough. And then there is something which comes in handy, which is the so-called molar volume, which is the uh, amount or the volume uh, one mole of inert gas would actually take up. And this, I take from my memory, is 22.4 liters per mole. And with this, we're directly able to convert these flows here to the molar flows. Which, again, consulting my sheet here, gives me which also tells me that I should have written this sheet a little bit larger, so something in the range of 0.9 to 1.6 mV per liter. To complete the mass balance, we also need to look at the exhale stream here, because we're not very efficient in the uptake. Yeah? So typically, if you measure, and there seems to be a more general agreement on that, that the proportion of oxygen in the exhale stream is still 0.16. And with that, you can do the same calculations here. You can do, calculate that, and then we can do this for the exhale stream. which I may have done. Which gives us these figures here in the exit stream. So this is the off-gas content of oxygen. We make a further assumption, as I hopefully have, didn't have too much of a dinner or something, so we assume that the buildup of biomass in our student is zero, which equals to accumulation to be zero. Then the difference between the intake and the exhaled oxygen stream must be what direction actually takes place. So this is the metabolic rate. So this is the metabolic rate of a student at rest. So far so good. So we know now that in the range of and this should be minimal, of course. I didn't carry this over properly. Okay. Can we somehow rectify this? Can we somehow get this to a proportion? And yes, we can, because what we can do is that we can look at the direction which is actually taking place. And make this fairly simple, let's assume that you only burn glucose. And you're only interested in the oxygen. And you can do this at home as well. It's fairly simple stuck very simple security because out of every glucose here you know, we get 6 CO2 and the mass balance or the balance of this reaction is actually fulfilled rather easily yeah, and you can check that. What I do know about this reaction you can also look this up that there's roughly an enthalpy here of 2,800 kilojoules per mole. So by doing this, there's a heat liberated of 2,000 kilojoules kilojoul per mole, and as accumulation is zero, this must be given off as body heat. So as a further outcome of this, we will generate body heat. And let's look at, at if, if this matches up how, somehow. The heat generated must be related 
to this by this equation. And I, now I have to be a little bit careful. And that's sometimes a little bit confusing because this here, these mole actually do not refer to any of these here, but they refer to the uh, number of times this actually takes place as a whole. So you have to pay, pay careful attention to the psychometry here. In order to get Q, we need to multiply the heat of reaction with our metabolic rate and pay careful attention to the actual uh, stoichiometry here and we have to divide the whole reaction enthalpy here by 6 and as this is uh, in the starting material as well so we're looking at consumption of oxygen this must be also negative okay what does this give us you can check the units of course of that we have millimoles here, we have kilojoules here, so this all balances out somehow. In the end, you get all of the kilojoules, you get what? Yeah, as heat generated. I hope you trust me on that, but check it, check it better, yeah, because this may be wrong. And we get a range of 60 to 140 volts. Is this correct? Yes, this is something which matches my expectations, because I would expect, on average, every male student to give up in the range of 100 volts body heat, yeah, which is typically taken as a calculation basis for any dimensioning of heating or anything, or cooling by the matter. And for the females, I would assume this to be about 80 volts per student. Yeah. So this is nicely in range, I would assume, to be correct if you check the rather course assumption we have made here. Okay, just to put this into a context, this is the same range I would expect you from mental exercise. So this does not change. Our mental exercise is already in the capacity of this ground bias, so to speak. Yeah? But in a fairly trained adult, there can be a tenfold increase of this, yeah, which also briefly matches my expectations because if you look at, for example, cyclists or sprinters or anything, they are assumed to have a power output in the range of 1000 to 1500 watts at peak as a sustainable effect over a short time. So this also is in the range of what you expect from a human here. You see that with rather simple assumptions, this can be here written out and as these here, these volume flows as well as the amount of exhaled gas here can be easily measured also in a bioreactor. Yeah? So if you don't take the student but we also take here a bioreactor. Yeah? So if you don't know whether there are students or microbial cells in there, it doesn't make this, this of a difference. You see that this is a powerful means to actually get to the metabolic rate, irrespective of the contents of our black box. So you have to pardon me to mislead you. Of course, this is all still related to microbial cells and their biotechnology. Thank you very much for your attention.
point. Five, two, 